chapter 8. We began reading at, verses, at verse 1. Our, our text is found in verses 9 through 25. Let's give our careful attention now to the reading of Holy Scripture. Acts chapter 8, beginning at verse 1. And Saul was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death. And on that day, a great persecution arose against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And some of the devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. Therefore, those who had been scattered went about announcing the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began preaching Christ to them. And the multitudes, with one accord, were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice. And many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was much rejoicing in that city. Now, there was a certain man named Simon, who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from the smallest to the greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. And they were giving him attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. But when they believed Philip, preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. And even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And he observed, as he observed, signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Now, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. And when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give this authority to me as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You had no part or portion in this matter. For your heart is not right before God. Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. But Simon answered him and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And so when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Amen. Be seated, please, as we turn to our hymn of preparation, uh, psalm of preparation, rather. Uh, Book of Psalms 125. Thank you. 
Amen. Let's pray. Gracious fathers, we come to your word. We bring our thanks to you for its grand and glorious revelation of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We pray, as Christ has proclaimed today, that you would be honored and glorified. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would grant us of your Spirit's help so that we might understand, give us eyes to see and ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The early chapters of the book of Acts, Luke lays the foundation for our understanding of the apostolic church. Uh, here in the formation of the ancient church, he shows us her origin, he shows us her mission, he shows us her character. First chapter opens as you will recall, with the great promise of the coming of the Spirit, the apostles were to wait in Jerusalem until they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. And Jesus said to those apostles before his ascension, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the end of the earth. Chapter 2 records the realization of the promise of the Spirit's coming. And we see the fruits of the Spirit in Peter's preaching and the many who were saved on that great day of Pentecost when the Spirit came upon the church of Jesus Christ. And the apostles already then are beginning to carry out their mission in Jerusalem. Chapter 3, with its healing of a lame beggar at the gate called Beautiful, gives us further, a further sampling of the apostles' work and the gospel's progress and the further fruit of the ministry of the Holy Spirit as the, the, the apostles continue to bear witness in Jerusalem, performing signs and wonders that astonish, and preaching Christ's resurrection. In chapters 4 through 7, and in the early portion of chapter 8, which we have read today, Luke documents the rise of Jewish opposition and the persecution of, of the church, the persecution of the apostles, the imprisonment of Peter and John, the imprisonment of all the apostles, and the stoning of the church's first great martyr, Stephen. We're told in chapter 8 and verse 1 that a fierce persecution arose that day. The day that Stephen was stoned, the, the force of the storm had welled and a, a, a persecution arose that day that uh, was so significant that the church of Jerusalem was scattered throughout Judea and the region of Samaria as well. And he says in verse 4 here of chapter 8, that those who had been scattered throughout Judea began to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. They began uh, to gossip the gospel. The reference in verse 4 is not to preachers, but to believers who had been scattered, who began to speak of the glorious work and the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And then in what follows, in this description of Philip in verse 5, he began preaching in Samaria. He went down to the city of Samaria and he began preaching Christ to them. And so this program that Jesus had announced in chapter 1 and verse 8 has progressed in its fulfillment, hasn't it? It began in Jerusalem. The church was scattered from Jerusalem. 
to the greater region of Judea and Samaria. And God is about the purpose of fulfilling that programmatic statement that Jesus gave to the apostles in chapter 1 and verse 8 concerning their mission and the witness that the, the apostles themselves and that the church would have as well. And then Luke pauses his account in Philip's ministry in the city of Samaria to introduce us to a certain man named Simon. Some of the church fathers identify Simon as the first source of heresy in the early church, even that well-known heresy called Gnosticism. Now, Luke doesn't tell us anything about that, so we shouldn't assume that, that Simon was a Gnostic. But he certainly was disruptive to the gospel. And the only detail that Luke gives us concerning this man is he was formally practicing magic in that city. Now, two significant questions arise from this text in verses 9 through 25. The first one has to do with Simon's profession of faith. Second one has to do with this matter of believers, those who had believed in Jesus, then receiving the Holy Spirit subsequently. First question we'll deal with today. The next question, Lord willing, we'll deal with next week. Two significant contrasts appear in our text as we think about Simon's faith. Two significant contrasts appear, the first of which is between Philip on the one hand and Simon on the other. Philip's magic act, Philip's performance of magic and, I'm sorry, Simon's performance of magic and Philip's preaching. And then the second contrast here is between the Samaritans who believed and were baptized and Simon, of whom it is also said that he believed and he was baptized. Luke distinguishes then, as we think about this first question of Simon's faith, between sensational activity and saving ministry between genuine faith and non-genuine faith. And those are the matters that will uh, take up our attention this morning. I want to consider with you, for, in the first place, Simon's sensational magic. Secondly, Philip's saving ministry. And then, finally, Simon's profession of faith. Simon's sensational magic. Philip's saving ministry, and Simon's profession of faith. Now, the first thing uh, that, we, that grabs our attention here is this sensational magic that Simon is performing. He's, it's something that certainly would, would have appealed to the senses. It would have probably appealed to our, sense, our senses if we were there, if we were observers of what Simon did. It apparently was very astounding. He, his practice amazed the people of Samaria. And it was drawing attention to himself. Verse 9 says the people of Samaria were astonished by his magic. He claimed to be someone great. Verse 10 says that from the greatest to uh, the least to the greatest, the Samaritans were paying attention to Simon. That's important. And then... The people hailed Simon as the great power of God. Now, at the least, they thought that he was doing these things, that he was performing his magic art by God's power. They may even thought that he was divine, that he was a god. Luke, on the other hand, would have us to understand that Simon's magic was anything but divinely empowered. 
He points out in, in verse 11 that Simon's activity had captured a wide range of attention in, among the Samaritans, from the greatest to the smallest, over an extended period of time. For a long time, he has, had astonished them with his magic arts. So Simon's magic was flashy. It drew attention to himself. It captivated the people's attention. It astonished them. And even though the worship of our day doesn't ordinarily include magic acts, I can't help but think of it I think that so much of it is designed to do exactly what Simon had calculated his magic to do, and that's capture the attention to astonish worshipers with the flashiness and the showiness of worship. More about that later, but in the first place, that's that's what Luke shows us, that Simon had this sensational magic act. But, but where, whereas his sensational magic act astonished the Samaritans, Philip's ministry saved the Samaritans. That's the second thing. Philip's preaching saved people in Samaria. And whereas Simon's ministry called attention to himself, Philip's ministry called attention away from Simon to the Lord Jesus Christ. Same verb is used in verse 10 of Simon's magic that was used earlier in verse 6 with reference to Philip's preaching. And so Philip is pointing the attention upon Jesus Christ. And in verse 12 we're told that Samaritans believed and tellingly it wasn't the signs and wonders that had captured their attention because Philip was doing those signs and wonders, you remember. That, that's what was reported earlier in chapter 8. But rather it was Philip's preaching concerning the kingdom of God, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, the good news about the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ. And having put their faith in Jesus... These Samaritans were baptized, men and women alike, the text says. Just as those first believers in Jerusalem were baptized, so these Samaritan believers are being baptized, even as Jesus has commanded. What's, what's Luke conveying in this contrast between Simon's sensational ministry and Philip's, uh, his sensational uh, magic and Philip's saving ministry. The gospel is overpowering Simon's magic act in Samaria. That's what the gospel does. It overpowers everything in line against it. And that brings us then to the contrast between the Samaritan's faith and Simon's faith, which brings us to our third point, Simon's profession of faith. This is the question, that first question that arises from our text concerning Simon's profession of faith. Having told us already that the Samaritans, upon hearing Philip preach Christ, believed and were baptized, remarkably, Luke says that Simon believed, and he was baptized. Verse 13, even Simon himself believed. That is, he professed faith in Jesus too. What do you think of, of his profession of faith and his baptism? Well, unlike the Samaritans, the first thing I think we should notice about Philip's, uh, Simon's faith is that it was directed toward Philip because you notice that the text tells us that he went on with Philip. He, uh, even Simon himself believed and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And 
What was it that captivated his attention? Just like the Samaritans were captivated with Simon's magic, Simon was captivated with Philip's signs and wonders. As he observed signs and wonders and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Already we're starting to get the sense that there's something fishy about Simon's profession of faith. But the answer to the question of the genuineness of Simon's profession of faith comes into clear focus after Peter and John come down from Jerusalem to Samaria, and the Samaritans who had believed previously received the Holy Spirit. Now again, that's something we'll not take up today. We'll take up that, Lord willing, take that up next week. Exactly what that means, that'll, that'll be our focus. But when Simon saw that, when he saw the, the when he saw these apostles lay their hands upon those who had believed, and they, they saw the outworking of their reception of the Holy Spirit, he offered them money. Verses not 18 and 19, it tells us. He, he attempted to buy his way to power. And what does that say about Simon? It says that his focus is still on magnifying himself through the working of wonders. His interest in the gospel of Jesus Christ went only so far as it could advance his desire for self-glorification. In his mind, the offer of money to the apostles for this power to lay hands on believers and, and grant to them the Holy Spirit would only serve to increase his bankroll and to increase his own power. Not only does Simon's profession of faith seem fishy, it's beginning to smell like fish that's been sitting out in the sun all day long. And it's beginning more and more to remind us of those who see the gospel as a means of gain for themselves. Even though Simon hasn't taken up any such ministry, it reminds us of so-called evangelists today who, with their flashiness and their showiness, capture the attention of hearers only to the end of stuff in their pockets full of money. But the genuineness of Simon's faith comes in, into sharpest focus in Peter's rebuke. Everything that Peter says supports the conclusion that Simon's profession of faith was not genuine. Verses 20 through 23. 21, he says, you have no part or portion in this. Your heart isn't right before God. Now, to be fair, that could be said about a believer too, couldn't it? It could be said of a believer that you, you have no part or portion in this. Your heart's not right before God. That's true of us sometimes. Isn't that true, that, that our heart's not right before God? Secondly, he says, verse 22, repent of your wickedness. Again, that could be said of a believer, any believer. It could be said of you or me. That we need to repent of our wickedness. But verse 23, most tellingly, says, You are in the gall of bitterness, and most tellingly of all, you are in the bondage of iniquity. Now that describes an unbeliever without any question, because believers are not in the bondage of iniquity any longer. They've been set free from the chains that once bound them to iniquity by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's language that simply cannot be misconstrued. In other words, 
Simon professed to be a believer, and he was baptized, but he wasn't a genuine believer. We, we don't need to think that Simon was intentionally trying to fool anybody when he professed faith and was baptized, but everything in the text points us to the conclusion that he was not genuinely converted. And we don't know what happened to Simon subsequently. It appears by his prayer request in verse 24 of our text that he had a tender heart toward what Peter said. He said, pray yourself. Pray to the Lord uh, for me yourselves that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. And so the gospel remained available to Simon as long as he lived. For all we know, he later came to the conclusion uh, that he was a sinner and needed to, needed to repent and believe in Christ, and he did so genuinely. But that's what we're left with. As we arrive at the answer to this first question. That someone may profess faith in Christ. Someone may be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And yet not be a genuine believer in Jesus Christ. And it shouldn't surprise us. Because the Gospels speak of, of others who believe and yet who didn't believe, truly and genuine, genuine. In fact, John's Gospel includes two instances that say that many believed in Jesus, but that they were not genuinely converted. The first instance is in John's Gospel, chapter 2. Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast. Many believed in his name, beholding his signs which he was doing. So the same sort of thing was taking place. Jesus was doing signs and wonders at Jerusalem, and many believed because of the signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them. For he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to bear witness concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. So these people believed, it says, they professed belief, but Jesus was not entrusting himself to them. He could see through their hypocrisy. He understood that, that their profession, these many so-called believers, many who profess faith in him, were not truly believers. The same, this, the very same thing is said later in chapter 8 of John's gospel. We're told that as he spoke these things, chapter 8 and verse 30, many came to believe in him. But then as we go on to read, he began speaking about those who had believed. They were Jews. And he said to those Jews, these many who have believed in him, if you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And there arose a dispute as to what, uh, what, what Jesus meant by uh, being free. The same kinds of misconceptions apparently uh, were around in that day and time as are around this day and time as to what Jesus meant when he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And these Jews said, we've We've never been slaves to anybody. And so on and on goes this discussion concerning whether or not they were truly Abraham's sons. And then what does Jesus do? He says, not only are you not Abraham's sons, but your father's the devil. Now, these are many who believe. Does that sound like a genuine conversion to you? Later on, they picked up stones to stone him. That doesn't sound like a true believer to me. Does it sound like a true believer to you? No. So we have these instances then in the Gospels. We have instances in the case of uh, men like Simon, who profess faith, receive baptism, but they weren't genuinely converted. 
Now, we're not always able to detect the difference between a true profession and a false profession of faith. Sometimes it's as plain as day. But Christ needed no man to tell him when there was a true profession. And certainly God can't be fooled. He knows every inconsistency between what I profess with my mouth and the true belief of my heart. He can easily tell the difference between true and false motives. He knows whether our worship is self-serving or God-serving. He has no trouble whatsoever distinguishing between hypocrisy and genuine faith. Luke distinguishes between sensational activity and saving ministry, between a genuine and a non-genuine profession of faith. And I think he does so for several reasons. The first is, as we think of broader application of our text, we should beware of sensationalistic activity in the church. Don't seek sensationalism in your Christian experience, in Christian worship, in your own piety. Be suspect of any church and any worship that draws attention to men. Be suspect of things that go on in worship services that are designed to captivate your attention. Preachers who draw attention to themselves instead of preaching Jesus. Worship that draws attention to worship leaders. Worship leaders who who put on spectacles, whether it's a musical spectacle or some other kind of spectacle, instead of leading worshipers into the presence of God. Beware of sensationalistic activity in the church of Jesus Christ. It pains me to have to say that. That this kind of activity goes on in the church of Jesus Christ. But secondly, know what constitutes a true profession of faith. It's important that you understand that not everyone who professes faith is a genuine Christian. Not everybody who's baptized is a genuine Christian. Satan sows weeds wherever the gospel seeds are sown. A true Christian is someone who has responded to the biblical gospel about the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ by turning from his sins, which we call repentance, and by trusting in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation. Simply professing faith Simply saying, I believe, even an intellectual belief in Jesus, an intellectual belief in God, being baptized, even giving assent to what the Bible says. You can say you believe, and you can say you believe what the Bible says about what you should believe. And you can be baptized, but that does not guarantee that you're saved. Remember those three important elements of faith that came forth from the Protestant Reformation. There is knowledge. You can't be saved without knowledge. You have to have true knowledge of Christ. You have to have true knowledge of who God is, the God of the Bible, the creator of the universe, and the Christ whom he sent to be a propitiation for the sins of his people. And then you have to give a sin. You can't be saved by a false gospel. You can't be saved by a false understanding of Christ. You can't be saved if you don't believe everything that the Bible tells us about Christ. If you deny Christ in any way, as he has clearly proclaimed in the Bible. But you see, that third element is the element that Simon was missing. 
And that's trust. There has to be knowledge. has to be assent. There must be a genuine trust. There has to be a putting of faith, a putting of all your stock. The death, the resurrection, the ascension, and the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And if a person isn't truly trusting in Jesus, there'll be indications in his own soul. If not to others, if others can't detect it, he will know whether or not he's truly converted, whether or not it's well with his soul. And in the Lord's mercy, just as the gospel remained available to Simon until his last breath, the gospel remains available until someone draws that last breath. There's no hope for anyone outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But in the gospel, there's hope for anyone who truly believes in him and turns from his sins to the Savior. So what does that say to to you and me? What does that say, children and adults, young people? What does that say? It means we need to be examining ourselves. What's the very first thing you should do before you come to the Lord's table? When you carry out that exhortation that Paul gave to examine yourselves, you should ask yourself, am I truly in Christ? Have I believed in Him? Is my trust in Christ and Christ alone? Are you, like Simon was, still in bondage to sin? You know, it'll be quite obvious if you are, won't it? Because those who are in bondage to sin can't do anything to please God. Those who are in bondage to sin can't be free of sin in any way. The gospel of Christ tells us that Salvation in Christ frees us from the chains that once bound us hard and fast to a life of sin. But that the only way to be released from that sin, the only way that it's possible to have victory is through faith in Jesus Christ. We sing it sometimes. Faith is the victory. Have you ever... Stop to think about what that means. Faith in Jesus Christ is the faith that overcomes the world. And it overcomes a world of sin. Is your faith resting in Christ and Christ alone for salvation as he's offered in the gospel? Remember the way Paul puts this idea of professing faith in Romans chapter 10? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You shall be saved. For with the heart, man believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth, he confesses resulting in salvation. Do you notice that pattern of confess, believe, believe, confess? These two are bound together. Heart belief and mouth confession belong together for true salvation. That's what Simon was missing. The heart belief. As you examine yourself, make sure that heart belief is firmly in place. Apart from it, dear friends, there is no hope whatsoever.
for salvation. Let's pray together. A glorious God and Father, we praise your great name and we call upon that name now. We thank you for Jesus and for the promises that you give to those who have believed in him, even the promises that are attached to the sacrament of baptism, the cleansing of our sin, the new life that you give to believers in Jesus Christ. Oh, we pray, our God, that if any under the hearing of your word today are apart from Christ, that you would release them from the gall of bitterness and from the bondage to iniquity. And that you would, in our hearts, cause great thanksgiving to well up that you have, through the righteous sacrifice and obedience of our Savior, Jesus Christ, released us from sin's chains and have enabled us to walk in righteousness before you. Hear our prayer and answer we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.